Hello everybody, welcome back into the Color Gemstone Academy. I am your host, Paul DC, and this is my YouTube channel, Paul DC Gemstones. Now, once again, if uh, you like what you see in this channel and you'd like to subscribe, it really helps me out a lot, moving me up the charts. In fact, at the time of this taping, we are almost up to 500 subscribers. So thank each and every one of you for doing that. And if you want to uh, comment or like or share, I'd love to hear from you in that way too. Before we get into this lesson, however, today, I have a new feature that I'm going to be instituting in each of these lessons. I get a lot of comments. Some are just, hey, we like the lesson. Some of them actually are some questions that might need to be answered. So I'm going to start each lesson with a couple of questions that I get because you may have the same question and you'd like to hear it answered. So I'm going to start with one that was from the lesson in Obsidian by a, a subscriber by the name of I'm not going to give anybody's last names. I wonder why, and we, we were talking about in Obsidian, how they were used over the years, even thousands of years ago, to make weapons, and they could have an, an edge that was even sharper than a stainless steel scalpel used in surgery. But however, they're not allowed, and I mentioned this in the lesson, they're not allowed to use that uh, as a surgical weapon on humans. And so Alan asks, I wonder why it's not allowed to be used on humans. Well, it's a very good and very logical question. My answer to that is three words, FDA, the, F the Food and Drug Administration in the United States. And I gave a very personal example when I was answering Alan's question, saying that I had to get back surgery uh, 15, 16 years ago. And I kept wondering, why can they do fix the knee and they can fix you know, all these other things, but they can't fix your back because I had a very bad back. Turns out they did. They've been doing it in Europe for 25 years. And when I got my surgery in the United States, uh, it was a considered experimental at the time. So there's a lot of you know, rules and regulations regarding uh, medical devices and things like that. And that's why they're not allowed to use the obsidian in surgery. All right, comment number two uh, is from Diana. It was on our uh, last week's, which was the birthstone for the month of November. And she said, thanks for the videos, Paul. I'm studying to be a gemologist. Your videos are informative and fun to watch. Well, thanks. I'm glad it's, uh, it's fun for you to watch that. And I gave a little bit of personal advice. If you're learning to be a gemologist, make sure you at least spend some time in a mine, whether it's abroad or here in the United States, because I've said this many times, I feel like I learned more from visiting gem miners than I did in all of the classes I took with the Gemological Institute of America. Just a couple of more. I won't, I won't bore you with a lot of them in each lesson, just maybe three or four. Oh, then we had um, Prairie Rose who commented on the November birthstone because I, I said at the beginning of that, it was Lisa's request because it is her birthstone. So she said, happy birthday, Lisa. I like that all of my subscribers are getting along. Um, and then we have Thomas uh, on the diamond lesson said awesome lesson again p.s. Your book has helped me a lot. He's the one that sent the picture of his uh, book, My book of, among his gemstone collection. So that's going to be my the end of my self Graduations of <laughs> congratulations of the the, the questions uh, that you might send in but th let's get into this lesson This lesson is about and I've gotten a number of requests from many of you. This lesson is about moissanite and a lot of people had very strong opinions about it. Some people say, oh, I don't really care for moissanite. Other people said, I'm really interested in this and I want to know what it is. And others said, is this a fake diamond? Is this um, uh, something that's just an imitation? Is it, a, is it a cheap imitation? But then other people said, well, why is it so expensive? I'm going to answer all of those questions. First of all, by stating it is not a fake diamond. It is not a fake anything. And if you don't know the difference between real and fake or genuine or artificial, I encourage you to go to an earlier lesson where we covered this subject matter. But I'm going to get back into it specifically on moissanite versus diamonds. Now, first of all, uh, when we did the diamond lesson, I was talking about it is carbon. That is the chemical composition. It is pure carbon. And over time, with tremendous heat and pressure, it creates something called a diamond. Moissanite, however, is a completely different gemstone altogether. It is silicon, silicon carbide. That is a chemical composition. Now, the uh, crystal structure 
of moissanite is hexagonal. And how does that differ in a diamond? A diamond is a cubic structure. So four sides rather than six sides. So that's another big difference between the two. On the Mohs scale of hardness, the moissanite is a 9.5, nine and a half, where diamond is a 10 out of 10 on the Mohs scale of hardness. So the diamond would be harder than the moissanite, although the moissanite's pretty hard. Uh, refractive index, now this is the one that might surprise you. The refractive index, and I remember that is a measurement of the sparkle of a gemstone. We always think of diamonds as being about the sparkliest gemstone that you can get. Well, the moissanite has a refractive index of 2.65 to 2.69. That's pretty good. In fact, that's very good. A diamond actually has a lower refractive index. So your diamond is between a 2.417 and 2.419. So yes, the moissanite actually has more sparkle than does a diamond. Specific gravity, remember that's how heavy does it feel, it's the heft uh, or the density of that gemstone. Well, they're both pretty good in that regard. The specific gravity of the moissanite is 3.22 and the diamond is 3.52. So the diamond would still have a little bit heavier, but it's really kind of a, uh, an interesting, they're close enough that a one carat moissanite will look pretty similar to the size of a one carat diamond. Now, where does moissanite come from? Why is it called moissanite? Well, this was first discovered by a French uh, uh, pharmacist and chemist by the name of Henri, spelled H-E-N-R-I, Henri Moissan. And um, he was actually studying rock formations in uh, I'm sorry, 1893. Well, he was examining rock samples in the meteor crater uh, located in Canyon Diablo in Arizona. Now, Diablo means devil, so this would have been the Devil's Canyon. And it was impacted by a big meteorite. So there was a, this crater, and he was uh, studying these rock formations. And at first, he incorrectly identified the crystals as diamonds. Now, you can understand that, because back in 1893, uh, the GIA wasn't even around yet, but it, it was um, so similar in its structure, he identified it as diamonds. And then later on, he identified uh, them as silicone carb carbide in 1904. So that's when he discovered this naturally occurring crystal called silicone carbide. Now, the interesting thing is it had been discovered, not discovered, it had been um, synthesized. So there was an artificial version of silicone carbide in a laboratory by Edward G. Atchison two years before the natural material had even been discovered. So that's really kind of interesting to me. And this Atchison character was, uh, you know, kind of an inventor. He was a scientist. And he actually wanted to sell, how do they say it? He had the temerity to try and sell a battery uh, invention to uh, Edison, Thomas Edison. Well, he ended up, Thomas Edison ended up hiring him and through his uh, experiments on the light bulb and electricity, um, he really stumbled upon uh, this way to make this silicone carbide in the laboratory. So um, it's so when people say, well, why is why is it so expensive? Why is silicone carbide or moissanite so expensive? Well, I'll get into that in the marketing aspect a little bit later in this lesson. But understand that natural silicone carbide is exceedingly rare and moissanite is not using the natural. It's, it's a laboratory created, and I'll talk about the marketing and how that came um, about. But to show you how rare this is compared to a diamond, natural silicone carbine until the 1950s, no other natural source of moissanite except that first crystal found in Diablo Canyon had ever been encountered until the 1950s. And it was in 19, 
uh, 58 when they discovered some natural silicon carbide in what is known as Green River Formation in Wyoming. And it's a pretty desolate place, but it, they found some of that same uh, silicon carbide. And then the only other place was probably the year after that when they discovered in Russia uh, in kimberlite. Now kimberlite is the rock where diamonds sometimes form. And they found some silicone carbide inclusions in the kimberlite in a, in a, uh, a place in eastern Russia that was a diamond mine. And so very, very seldom have they ever found naturally occurring silicone carbide. Now I happen to love moissanite. I know some people have opinions, yay or nay, about the moissanite. And over the years of being in the shopping channel industry with Home Shopping Network, with uh, uh, QVC, um, Judy, uh, my wife, has also had uh, experiences with this moissanite. In fact, this is a pair of earrings that that are her personal pair of earrings, and they are incredibly sparkly. This picture is probably not doing it justice. The other thing that I find when you look at um, the moissanite, it almost reminds me of sort of the old European cut diamonds or the old mine cuts where you see actually a dispersion of some color in there instead of just no nothing but white light back to the eyes. And that's something I think that moissanite does successfully more so than diamonds. And diamonds these days, it's all about the white light reflecting uh, back to the eye. But we know a little bit of the inside scoop of, of the history of the marketing of this stone. So you have to go back to 1998. And you might have heard of a company by the name of Charles and Colvard. Now they were the ones that were manufacturing the gem grade moissanite that we offered on the shopping channels over the years. So it was introduced in 1998. They received patents to create and market lab-grown silicon uh, carbide and they were the first company to ever apply for the patent and get it and that they were doing a very very good job of marketing this uh, moissanite for many 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 years and yes it was kind of pricey but not as pricey as a diamond not nearly so was it more than cubic zirconia yeah but deservedly so so i think these days i don't know maybe a one carat uh, nice specimen of a moissanite might set you back $600 or so. Um, of course, that doesn't compare anything to the similar look in a diamond and a one carat flawless internal diamond that you would spend. But we were, when I say that we were kind of on the forefront of this scoop, uh, there was a, a, a buyer when I first went to QVC, his name was Dan Chase. Hi Dan, if you're watching, I hope that you didn't mind me dropping your name. He was, he was the best buyer, I think, that I've ever had in the industry. He went on to become an executive at Jewelry Television in Knoxville. And then he started to um, work on his own with factories and, and uh, marketing and gemstones. And he kind of let us know that he was working with a company out of Australia. And he said, very, very, very soon, um, the patent is going to run out on Charles and Colvard. And he was right, and I did the research, and it, the patents in the United States expired in 2015. Uh, 2016, pretty much the rest of the worldwide patents had expired. I think the last one was uh, 2018 in Mexico. And what that meant is that more players were going to be able to get into the business. Now, again, you have to know what you're doing, and you have to be able to synthesize that silicone carbide in a lab, and that's not cheap. It still costs a lot of money to do so. But competition is a healthy thing. So that's when he introduced us to a supplier um, that was based in Australia. And we were able to find some of the moissanite at far reduced prices. Now there are gonna be people that are gonna still tell you to this day. Well, Charles and Colvard, they know what they're doing. They do the best of, of all the material. And that, that may be true. But I still think that, that a little bit of competition is a healthy thing. So you might find um, since those days, the moissanite in the jewelry industry has become a little bit more affordable than it ever was in the past. Well, that's going to do it for our lesson 
brief as it was on Moist tonight. Thank you so much for joining me. Remember, if you have not done so yet, please hit subscribe. It really does help me move up the charts. Uh, also, if you'd like to share this uh, lesson, I'd like you can do that on your channel as well. I appreciate that. And then I will see all of you next week at 10 a.m. Eastern Time on Saturday when our next lesson in the Colored Gemstone Academy will drop. Thanks for watching, everybody. Mm -hmm.